All right. So, here's our warm-up character. Let's get started. Um, oh, I have the PHB open because uh, a couple nights ago in chat, someone had asked about possibly building a barbarian-wizard combination. And so I've been thinking on that. I've been uh, trying to find ways to put it together. What would be a cool combination? Uh, taking into consideration some of the limitations that the two classes have against each other. <clears throat> Pardon me. But we'll, uh, we'll get to that here soon enough. I think I might have a, a good basic working knowledge. Here's our handy-dandy, trusty, random character generator. Starting off with race and sub-race, we're going to roll 2d10. Come down to the generator. 2d10. Let's roll it. Here we go. Six and a one. So the race is going to be six, and it's going to be sub-race one because it's an odd number. Then we're going to determine if we have a female, one to 45, Male, 46 to 90, or a multi-class character, which is 91 to 100, and then we would re-roll again for the gender. <clears throat> Percentile, go. 81. Male. If we don't end up randomly generating a multi-class character, by the way... Um, I'll set some time aside, and we will purposely craft two different types of multi-classes. That way, it's a good demonstration to you all on how to go about doing that. 5th edition has streamlined it really well. It's not as complicated as it might have been, or at least seemed, in other editions. Um, so it's something that you should never worry about having to do. It can open up some options, and it creates even more varied characters than the already varied ones we're getting as just a, a straight up and down class. <clears throat> oh, welcome back, Rody. Cottage cheese and blueberries. I had some cottage cheese earlier for uh, for breakfast. Uh, the blueberries is a good touch. I like it with a little bit of pineapple myself. Our alignment is going to be two percentile rolls, so we're going to come down here and roll two D100s. Uh, the first set is going to be for um, good, neutral, evil. And the other is going to go along the, uh, the axis of lawful, neutral, chaotic. <clears throat> Roll our two percentiles. 94 and 62. Well, girls and boys, I think we're going to have ourselves a uh, another villain here. Right? There's a 10% chance down here to get an evil character. We rolled into that. And 62, we have a neutral evil character of some kind. Does this character have or use feats? Roll back to 1d100. A 13. That is no. This is going to be a straight ability bump character. <clears throat> and now we roll a d12 to determine the base class for this possibly villain. But again, the last time we rolled a neutral evil character... He was a very compelling part of a story. So, you know, we don't have to throw him under the villain bus just yet. Besides, depending on what we roll here, if it's Cleric or if it's Paladin, then we will get to go over and tickle the DMG, the Dungeon Master's Guide, in order to open up the Death Domain uh, for Clerics or the Oathbreaker uh, Oath. Uh, that's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Well, whatever. You get what I'm saying. <laughs> the Paladin's uh, archetype will be an Oathbreaker. You know, or they've been called Blackguards in the past, or Anti-Paladins. Um, there's, I, I'm sure there's some other synonyms that I'm missing as well. Without further ado... Four. One, two, three. Ooh. Ooh. Hello, Mr. Druid. Oh, you know what? Haha. 
I uh, I skipped over what level this druid's going to be. Uh, I was in such a re uh, such a rush to determine if uh, he's going to have feats that I forgot to roll a D one one D one hundred for the level spread. Rolling that is a sixty three. <clears throat> Level 10. Just inside the level 10 spread over here. Druid 10. Now let's go back to our D12 and determine which kind of druid we're working with. More of the spellcastery druid? Or uh, more of the shape changey melee druid? Uh, odds is 1, evens is 2. Odds is 1. So this is going to be Circle of the Land. Uh, that's the more, like, spellcasty style. I don't say that to box them in. Um, more thematically, you are you tend to be more casty. Not that you can't change shape or whatnot. It's just... We'll get to it. I don't need to explain. <laughs> uh, during this process, by the way, <clears throat> if any of you have questions, whether you're live in chat or if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you can always leave a reply... Um, in chat or in the comment section and I'll see it and I'll get back to you on maybe what something is, uh, why we chose to go a certain route, or if you had some kind of a, um, a counter idea, you know, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, if we did this instead? I'm always open to it. You know, I may save a character and call it complete, but characters are always growing, always changing, or we can always say, oh, you know what, this is cool in this setting. And uh, if you're running a game that is themed in a different way, maybe we can make some twi uh, some little like tweaks and adjustments here and there in order to flavor that character for what you want to do. Neutral evil sounds uh, sounds fun. Well, you can you're arguably freer to do more things as a neutral evil character, um, right? Because you don't necessarily have to restrain yourself. Uh, let's come down and, ooh, six. This is going to be a forest gnome druid. Mm, pardon. This will be interesting, interesting, especially as a druid, because forest gnomes, uh, regardless of anything else they play, uh, get more nature -y tendencies to them. Like, the ability to empathize and communicate with animals and um, and go from there. <clears throat> uh, let's come over and do our background quickly. We'll come down to the, the, custom, the custom slot, type in 13, hit roll. This is going to be background 1, which is Acolyte. And as we look here... In the chart, Acolyte doesn't have any particular options, um, unlike, uh, you know, the, the merchant, the guild merchant, you have 20 different things that you could possibly be making or selling. Uh, so this is going to be a straight up 2d8 for the personality traits, and then d6s for the others. Dice roller, 2d8, roll. Here we have a 5 and a 1. And 3d6. For a 5, 3, and a 2. Good. We have those placeholders in place. Throw in our customary... Placeholders 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8 for the, the kind of the normal distribution spread of ability scores. Hey, Sporty Ron. Uh, still need to create my character. I actually was uh, just talking about that a little bit earlier. It might have been before you came into the chat, but <clears throat> uh, I, have the, I have the PHB open. Actually, you can see it. You can see it here. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I went to the background. Anyway, just trust me. Uh, I was uh, looking at options for 
how to take the wizard half of the wizard barbarian you're looking at. And uh, so today I was sitting down and I was going through some calculations on which schools might be best to focus on. Um, I'm leaning a little bit towards having the Barbarian go uh, in the Divination school route. Not that you're confined to only cast Divination spells, but you get certain abilities that are related to the school that you study. And one of those uh, at level 2 is you get to roll 2d20. Uh and you, you record those down someplace. And for the rest of the day, you can use one of those D20s in place of something else. And so, you know, if you think about this raging barbarian who has uh, precognition, uh, that, that could be a really cool or dangerous combo. Uh, the other path, uh, path I was thinking was going abjuration, since that tends to be some protection spells or even like banishment spells. And that might be a cool direction to take as well. It really, um, actually, uh, I should ask though, Sporty Run, all eight schools are open. We can build this Barbarian on any combo you want. So, uh, while I'm finishing this character out, if you want to, in chat, you could whisper if you want, but if you want in chat to mention what kind of, um, uh, what kind of angle you want the barbarian to take like do you want like a necro barbarian do you want a conjurer barbarian so that you know uh he or she is making objects appear uh an illusionist barbarian something along those lines um let me know what you're thinking and that way i can i can better custom tailor the thoughts in that direction instead of just making you know kind of an average what i think would be a good combination uh okay let's get back to this quickly we have a couple more things to roll. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, we just started character generation. We have a male forest gnome whose alignment is neutral evil, going uh, the druid route, and has an acolyte background. Uh, so this is treating nature as a form of uh, religious worship, or at least in the past, probably in the present still. Um, so instead of just being like the hermit living out in the woods, you revere the woods. You recognize the spirits and the trees, and you're treating it with a sanctity. Um, or in this case, neutral evil. Mm, we can have some fun with this. All right. Here's our genome stats highlighted for you. Bop down the second page quickly. They start at 2 foot 11, and we're going to roll 2d4 to add some inches. 3, okay. 3 foot 2 inches tall. And we're going to take that same number, uh, 3, and we're going to multiply that times 1 pound and add that to the base weight. So, weighing in at a mighty 38 pounds is... To be named. <clears throat> now, let's roll one percentile down here and find out how old this character is. Eight. All right, just past Child Prodigy, uh, we're in the, the larger section here of Young Adulthood. Again, for any of you making personal characters, you don't always have to put a descriptor of young adult or elder or child prodigy or whatever. I do that here with you all because it it's a good, uh, helpful reminder of what kind of a mindset or what stage of life, which stage of life, this character is in. So it can help us flesh him or her out in a roleplay setting. Uh, because of the huge discrepancies in natural lifespan. I mean, let's let's look at the sheet down here, right? We have dwarves who reach uh, cultural adulthood at 50 but can live to be three, 350 years or older, yet just beneath that, elves, 100 to 750. So just putting an age down for your character, uh, unless it's, it's you who knows your character, can be kind of wonky. So by putting descriptors like this, we can get into the mind frame of, yes, a young adult human is 16 to 25 years old. So if we say young adult half-elf, 
then we can scale that a little bit more to the uh, stretched out uh, spread of uh, life expectancy. So hopefully that makes sense for you all. As gnomes reach uh, intellectual adulthood at 40, but they can live to be 450, I think it would be safe to... I think it would be safe if we rolled a... Uh, let's see. Let's, let's, let's say we rolled a percentile and we got the maximum. So that would be 140 to adulthood. And then 240 to midlife. 340 for old, 440 for venerable. So I think we're going to do that uh, in, in making this spread. We're going to roll a D100 and add that to the cultural adulthood starting number and see where it goes. One D100, go! <laughs> 100. Okay. So this, uh, this gnome is just exiting young adulthood into adulthood at the ripe old age of 140. <laughs> uh, less and less people are going to show up to that high school reunion uh, in a uh, in a like a mixed race community. Uh, Sporty Ron I'm, uh, says I'm thinking about the making things appear one. So go for a, a conjuring barbarian. Uh, that is. That can be doable. Uh, any of them are. Um, you know, let me know what you're thinking. There are eight schools of magic. So if you wanted to make sure that you're reviewing them all and what they generally do, we can make anything work through storytelling, through mechanics, through the, the blend of both. We'll, we'll make it work. But whatever school is really r ringing out to you. Um, and then... There are less options on the Barbarian side because we can go with Path of the Berserker, which is, you know, fueled by this rage and you're just this unstoppable, like, combat machine. Or we could go the Totem Warrior, which is a, not a magic class, but it is kind of a mystical class where they take on aspects of uh, various animals in order to uh, provide them benefits. Rody says the neutral evil gnome is... Uh, littering and thoughtlessly poisoning nature. Uh, yeah, you know, just kind of emptying out that tobacco pipe wherever. Um, you know, uh, spitting uh, spitting the chaw juice, uh, you know, just against a tree. and uh, Bubonic one, welcome. It's good to see you again. Not necessarily neutral evil could be a character who hates anyone who defiles nature and will do anything, anything to protect it. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um... So that is the overzealous, you know, like the, uh, if we went on the defensive side, then yeah, it's, you know, a drunk guy stumbles out into the woods and, you know, answers nature's call and this druid pops out and, uh, says, uh, nay, nay, as, uh, you know, he transforms you into an animal or shanks you or bops you with a shillelagh or something. Or we could go the more aggressive, um, like eco-terrorist. Uh, route where uh, it's it's more aggressive uh, where this uh, where this gnome hunts like proactively hunts or tries to destroy the logging settlement or can even do something like um, if you go into the middle of a city right and you cast a, a spell to make a bunch of trees grow in the middle of this dirt street. What's that going to do to traffic and, uh, and mer uh, like merchant transactions and all this other stuff? So, you know, we'll see what the background uh, helps flush out to see a little bit more. That's a good suggestion, though, uh, Bubonic One. Uh, Sporty, no, that's fine. Take your time, man. We're, we're warming up our, our brain juices here. We're getting them simmering. We're making a random sample character to get going in this first part, as we will almost always do in these broadcasts. Uh, we have a whole world to populate, and we're going to do it one character at a time. All right, uh, something else to keep in mind, hair, skin, eye color, uh, or texture, or shape, or whatever. Uh, we're going to fill those in at the end as we're making the life of this character. And ultimately, we're going to need a name. Uh, don't worry about providing one just yet, because again, you know, whether it's a nickname or, you know, it's a it's a druidic given name uh, or however we want to flavor this. 
coming back up. We are finished now with our rando calculator. Coming down here to our Pahaba. Inspiration. And here's our acolyte. You have spent your life in the service of a temple to a specific god or pantheon of gods. You act as an intermediary between the realm of the holy and the mortal world, performing sacred rites and offering sacrifices in order to conduct worshippers into the presence of the divine. You are not necessarily a cleric. Performing sacred rites is not the same thing as channeling divine power. Choose a god, a pantheon of gods, or some other quasi-divine being from among those listed in Appendix B, or those specified by your DM, and work with your DM to detail the nature of your religious service. Were you a lesser functionary in a temple, raised from childhood to assist the priests in the sacred rites? Or were you a high priest who suddenly experienced a call to serve your god in a different way? Perhaps you were the leader of a small cult outside of any established temple structure, or even had an occult group that served a fiendish master that you now deny. Skill proficiencies insight and religion having a wisdom uh skill given to you especially as a druid's nice because druids cast off of wisdom so we'll be intrinsically a little bit better in those regards bubonic one yeah an eco terrorist yeah <laughs> you know if you guys are digging that um uh we can go in that direction uh this is we're, we're here to have fun and throw out ideas Languages. Oh, we get two of our choice. Well, coming down here then. We're already going to receive Common and Gnomish, which is based on the Dwarven alphabet, at least in this, by default, out of the Pahaba. And we're going to get two more. So I'm going to indicate that with question marks. And another thing for us to mentally keep track of as we're building a story, which other languages would this... Uh, would this gnome be able to speak? Equipment. A holy symbol. A gift to you when you enter the priesthood. I'm sure in some way we could make this like a primal focus or something along those lines. For right now, holy symbol. Prayer book. By the way, uh, if you didn't want to go druid for a character that you play... You can go cleric and take the uh, the nature, uh, uh, take the the nature domain, and that will give you a lot of cleric naturey powers. So you can it's sort of the other side of the druid coin. Which angle do you want to take? Bubonic one is already getting some some imagery here: black piercing eyes, oily black hair, and heavily warty dark skin. Okay. Uh, something like that. Uh, maybe maybe the, we shape change into like a giant toad or something. And as that's the favorite form, some of those transmutations over the years have left some uh, lingering effects. Uh, keep keep that in mind, uh, bubonic one, in case I derp out on it, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. prayer book or a prayer wheel. Ooh. We'll put that down. That, that could be interesting. Some incense. Some vestments. Which would be Maybe maybe he travels in them, but that's more what you would wear during an official ceremony of some kind, not day-to-day -day living. Common clothes. Belt pouch. And 15 gba. Let's come over here. We were down by the sea playing last time. We're going to keep it on Samurai HQ for the time being. Very cool. Here's our feature. Shelter the Faithful. As an acolyte, you command the respect of those who share your faith 
and you can perform the religious ceremonies of your deity. You and your adventuring companions can expect to receive free healing uh, and care at a temple, shrine, or other established presence of your faith, though you must provide any material components needed for spells. Those who share your religion will support you, but only you, at a modest lifestyle. You might also have ties to a specific temple dedicated to your chosen deity or pantheon, and you have a residence there. This could be the temple where you used to serve, if you remain on good terms with it, or a temple where you have found a new home. While near your temple, you can call upon the priests for assistance, provided the assistance you ask for is not hazardous and you remain in good standing with your temple. This is why I like backgrounds in 5th edition, because they act as a bridge between uh, fluff, uh, which is uh, backstory and storytelling and all that, and crunch, right? You're getting mechanical benefits, the crunchy bits, from your background, and then you're getting fluffy bits, and then where the two meet is something practical like this, which, um, I don't know, let's say that we're creating, uh, let's even say that we're creating um, a crusading paladin, right? Serves the very common god of, like, like a, a paylor, right? Goodness and life and sun, sunshine and babies and everything. Well, as you're traveling throughout your campaign, your paladin is providing room and board or some other services so that you as a DM or even you as players don't have to always micromanage your funds, um, where you're sleeping, or uh, you don't always have to roll on tables or charts or at your DM's whim in order to be provided, um, in order to be provided some basic advice or supplies. It's a natural result of what you did as a job or a lifestyle before you took up adventuring for whatever reason you did. Bubonic ones uh, suggesting Agma as the uh, as the chosen god. Uh, yeah, well, we can we can develop that here. Personality traits first is five, so we're coming up to the top up here. I quote. Or misquote sacred texts and proverbs in almost every situation. This is fun because this allows you as a character, if this is a PC, or as a DM, if you're offering this as an NPC slash uh, villain or uh, what's often referred to as a BBEG or the big bad evil guy. Um, because you have a villain, right? He's he's willing to do all these acts of eco terrorism. If we're going to stick in that in that direction, and uh, then uh, oh, think uh, think like the sheriff of Nottingham in Robin Hood Men in Tights, right? Uh, he would always mix up his words and kind of bungle something, or the Sicilian in um, Princess Bride. Uh, so you you have this villain who wants to come out and do a monologue or something along those lines and absolutely just sort of bungles the words up and says something embarrassing or silly or even contradictory. You know, uh, come out, aha, you fools, I'm here to destroy you. And as the, you know, as the the bark of uh, the, the, the scrolls written on the, on the parchment made from the bark of the destroyer tree say, you know, love everything around you. Oh, no, wait, that wasn't it. And that can act as... A motivation for maybe why the, the villain is villainous, or it offers a little bit of a comedic uh, relief in the midst of a very tense time. And that can turn a villain or NPC or a PC into a much more memorable character. Personality trait number two is number one. <laughs> I idolize a particular hero of my faith and constantly refer to that person's <laughs> deeds and example. Going this route, if we're doing this, um, if, uh, if any of you have seen, uh, uh, read the manga or seen the, uh, the anime Berserk, there was an enemy general that showed up for a while and was like sort of like a plaguing antagonist. 
And every time he would come into combat, he would boast about this secret family technique that's been passed down. And the first time he says, it's been passed down in the Korbowitz line for the last uh, hundred years. And then, of course, he gets defeated. He shows up again with a stronger force. Aha, I have you now. And now I'm going to employ the secret technique passed down in the Korbowitz family for the last 300 years. And it builds until finally the character is like, didn't, didn't he... It, why is it the thousand years now? Didn't he just say it was 500 last time we met? And so you can create something along those lines where you still have a strong and boastful villain, and maybe he doesn't even realize that uh, things are escalating. But it can create this interaction. Uh, Bubonic One offers uh, Sylvan and Goblin for languages. Oh, wow, I've thought of a decent hostile who could be a tentative ally. Are you referring to how this, uh, to how this character could maybe start off as uh, as an antagonist or as a rival and uh, be won over by the by the the imaginary PC band that would be coming through. You know as well, uh, we still have a, a fairly powerful wizard uh, that's coming in. Uh, this could also be a good candidate for who we want to weave in as the visiting wizard to uh, Lely Wellen's vineyard which was the city we created a couple nights ago. Um, or if you're watching this at a later point in time, just scroll down a little bit and look for that name. Uh, who's come in and is looking to, you know, disrupt things a little bit, right? We have an eco-terrorist, and so maybe he's the one who's making the aqueducts clog up or, the, or you know, purge the arcane magics, or he wants to release the beast that we said lives in the lake. Sporty Ron, welcome back. Ideals. Five. Faith. I trust that my deity will guide my actions. I have faith that if I work hard, things will go well. We did roll a neutral character. This is indicating this is more of a lawful alignment. There's nothing in that description alone that... Sorry, a cat's being a cat. Hey, hey. What are you doing? Anyway, I should I should make a command like uh, exclamation point cat anytime that they are showing up or I have to address them and talk to them because clearly um, I speak cat and they understand English. <laughs> Uh, Sporty Ron asks, what kind of magic school makes things appear? Um, well, that is going to depend on your definition. Um, all of them can to some degree. You could say necromancers make uh, undead things appear. Conjuration makes things appear. Um, illusion makes things appear to appear. Um, evocation makes um, things appear and uh, like energies appear and directs them in a particular fashion. Uh, Sporty, the one that I was addressing is a, uh, a little, a little calico, and, um, her big brother, Tabby, here, is, uh, looking to maybe get into some trouble as well. The, the Tux is, uh, sleeping, like, uh, peacefully somewhere, and is an absolute doll. Bonds, three. I owe my life to the priest who took me in when my parents died. If we wanted to modify this, we could just put brackets around parents died and just refer back to it as, you know, insert tragedy here. Flaws. Every character is flawed, villains, heroes aside. We, as uh, broadcasters and chatters, uh, we all have our flaws. I put too much trust in those who wield power within my temple's hierarchy. Ah, so here's our acolyte, right? Our, uh, our nature acolyte who's been sent out, thinks he's doing the work of his, his circle, or even kind of a, almost like a Team Rocket thing, right? They're, they're out doing evil things, and I'm not saying Team Rocket's not an evil organization, but uh, they kind of bungle it up, and they think they're acting in the best interests, sometime autonom or sometimes autonomously. So he may be given orders and ends up um, putting his own twist on them, 
thinking, oh, well, I've been chosen for this job, and, and I, I'm going to go out and make sure that, you know, they wouldn't have chosen me if they didn't suspect that I would be doing things the way that I want them done. We can take this in a lot of angles. Uh, Sporty says, I like bringing the dead alive, so a, uh, 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 uh like a necro-barbarian or a barb-romancer. <laughs> All right, now we're going to come back up to races and go down to Forest Gnome. Here we are. Int is going to increase by two by, uh, for any gnome. We've already done age and alignment. No need to worry about that. We've done size. Speed is 25 feet. We do get... Dark Vision, 60 feet. We get Genome Cunning. We've already done Languages. And by being a Forest Gnome, our Dex is going to... We'll make a little mark here so we know. Our Dex is going to come up a little bit. And we know the Minor Illusion Cantrip. Intelligence is our spell uh, is our spell casting ability for it. Depending on your campaign and your DM, you might be willing to argue, "Hey, I'm making a druid. Uh, could we use my wisdom instead?" So I'm, you know, halfway decent at it at least. You know, you're gonna have to work with your DM because if your DM says no, let's play it by the book. It was meant to be that way for a reason. Then you know, be a good sport about it, and maybe at a future time you say, "Well, hey, look." I gave in to you on the int versus wisdom. Like, I understand it was an exception, uh, but I rolled with it. Now, in this case, uh, would you be willing to work with me? And you continue to try and negotiate. We'll drop this in real quick. Minor illusion. And speak with small beasts isn't uh, isn't speak with animals as per the spell. It's a little bit more generic. And in, in fact, that ability could even get overwritten by the druid spell speak with animals. Though, in a in an environment maybe where magic doesn't work or uh, this character doesn't want to cast magic, maybe for fear of being detected, uh, he can still get his point across to uh, some of the more simpler animals around. Speak with small beasts. Sir, uh, Sir Rhodium says, I speak squirrel, but not fluently. Yes. Squeak, squeakity, squeak, squeak, squeakums, uh, squeak. Uh, Sporty Ron uh, seems to like the idea of a, a, a necrobarb. Uh, if you like that, then um, I'll still tinker with it in the background, and I'll, I'll see what I can whip up here. Uh, Bubonic One says, Sylvan Protector Gnome who was raised by goblins. Misguided at first, he hates humans, but is confused why Elvish and Sylvan people support them. Ah, that that could be very interesting too. So he was brought up under this, you know, this goblin faith out, uh, you know, in a, a goblin tribe in the woods, or maybe even at the the base of a mountain, and uh, and so yeah, that works into the background really well. That could explain why uh, he would be able to speak goblin and why his culture and ideals can sometimes seem off, or why you know he rolls into a town and people look at him in a funny. Uh, bubonic one says not all goblin gods are evil that's true um you know just like any other sentient peoples uh if they have a a pantheon of different uh gods uh oh, there's not even saying that they can't just have you know the uh, monotheistic the like a one true goblin god but if we want to go pantheon then you know goblins would still want a fertility goddess of some kind or a god or a goddess uh for you know raising crops or bugs or whatever they eat or just to increase their population uh, gods of war or magic, things along those lines. Uh, Bubonic One also says that uh, some goblin clans are technically not evil. Yeah. Um, I know Pathfinder, like, goblins are kind of the uh, the golden child of, of Pathfinder, and they have a lot of goblin-related content for that. And it, there's nothing saying you can't bring the two back and forth. And again, in D&D &D 5e, this is your world. Have it be whatever you want. 
Steel Dust uh, suggests uh, he could have been part of the same order as the caretaker character, but was betrayed as he saw it, but kept a twisted view of their ideals. Ah, okay. Um, you know, I'm I'm picking up what you're you're putting down. And uh, oh, and hello, Big Break, welcome back. For those of you uh, lurking, just commenting, just joining, we have a uh, evil forest gnome druid that we're that we're bringing to life now. And there's already a ton of stuff that we can do with them. I was just at a game store today and, and got uh, into a couple D&D groups. Cool. Hopefully those work out for you. Uh, be sure, though, and I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not undermining you uh, by saying this. I'm not trying to sound patronizing. As you broach the topic and then as offering general advice, make sure... Oh, hey, thank you, Delcorin. I appreciate the uh, the host, and, you know, it still looks like uh, Peter's not impressed. You're going to have to do a little bit more. <laughs> um, uh, make sure, Sporty, that you don't overextend yourself. Ah, <laughs> and thank you again. Uh, well, not thank you again, but thank you, Rody, also for uh, directing your channel towards me. Uh, I super appreciate it. Uh, doing that, everyone will actually earn you some extra experience points, which is the in-chat currency that you can spend on a draw from the deck of many things. That's exclamation point deck. Or you can duel each other uh, with exclamation point duel, space, the person's name, space, and the amount you want to um, put up for, um, for dibs. Uh, so yeah, Sporty, get into it. Make sure, though, that as a player or as a DM, uh, that you can commit. Uh, having having players or DMs flake out, um, or even just you run into a circumstance, a life circumstance, where you get sick, or there's a family emergency, and suddenly you can't make it to three games, you know, like even three separate games with three separate groups, let alone ones that have the same people, um, that can cause a lot of disruption. So find your balance, find what works for your schedule and for your interests, and uh, and pursue it. Go from there. Delcorn says he's a little demon monkey, so his opinion of me doesn't matter. Yep, uh, he's uh, he's an imp, as uh, as he's described. All right, so we filled in our racial traits. Now it's time to zoom, go down, cleric. And uh, as I was talking about before, we have Tempest can be kind of a druidic, uh, like a naturey cleric bend if you wanted. Um, that's more on maybe the the destructive side. And then you have the nature domain itself. And and look at these domain spells you get as a nature cleric: animal friendship, speak with animals, bark skin, spike growth, plant growth, wind wall, dominate beast, grasping vine, insect plague, and tree stride. Uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff that you can get access to. Um, that that flavors uh, that flavors your cleric chassis in a primal or a naturalistic fashion. All right, here is our druid, our druid of the ruins. Level 10, we are going to get wild shape. This is what's going to allow us to turn into monsters. Um, they give you some recommendations in here. If you're playing a druid, uh, you shouldn't need another book other than the PHB, but you could have some fun if you did uh, get to consult a Monster Manual or Volo's Guide to Monsters, and um, may or maybe if you looked at some other material outside, too, that has monster stat blocks for things that you think would be a cool wild-shaped form. And at second, we choose our druid circle. We've already done that, Circle of the Land. In fact, uh, Wizards every so often puts out something called Unearthed Arcana, which is official Wizards content that's meant to be play-tested within 5th uh, edition. So it's not official 5th edition content, but it's stuff that can work with 5th edition. And the latest one they put out is... Uh, well, no, I, I think they, they added three sub-races. I think before that they added another Druid Circle that you could try, called the Circle of Spores. Um... 
So that's something to check out. Uh, I did modify the home page of the channel. If you look down below the chat commands, there's a list of useful links for you all to be able to use. So you can reference it, uh, even if I'm not broadcasting. You can pop over and be like, oh yeah, there's the link to this thing. Uh, towards, I think it's the last link, is the database that has all of the unearthed arcana. Um, so, something to consider. Wild Shape, we, Ability Score, we got it. Druid Circle Feature, we'll write that when we get to it. Wild Shape Improvement. Okay. So, Straight Up Druid is... Um, you know, you'll notice that casters don't get a ton of stuff under features. That's because their spells are defining features of who they are. And so, as a full caster, Druids are going to get a lot more love in that direction than they will just be given things like... The rogue has something like every level, it seems. Okay. We're 10th level, so this is 10d8 hit dice, which, remember, is your natural potential, no pun intended, to recover from battle in some way, you know, mentally, physically, that kind of a thing. It's, it's your daily capacity to self-heal, uh, self catch your breath, that kind of a thing. Uh, no temps, and we'll come back for the hit point maximum in a little bit. We're going to get some proficiencies from our class. That is going to be light, medium, armor, shields. Now, in parentheses, it says druids will not wear armor or use shields made of metal. That is a thematic choice. That is a lifestyle choice for a druid, right? You were raised in nature. Uh, you're surrounded by all the things that, that nature could hope to give you through natural processes. Uh, do you need to, you know, extract minerals from the earth and then wear the, you know, wear the corpse around you when, yeah, you might wear furs or something, but at least you had to hunt it down and, and the animal even had to be there and you had to be there. Can a druid in 5th edition wear full plate metal armor and still act? Yes. Though the way that the druid was developed in 5th edition was presuming that you would not do that as the preferred lifestyle of the druid. You know, just like your druid maybe is vegan or is a, a pescatarian, right? Uh, vegetables, but only fish. Or um, or maybe maybe you actually just have a, a carnivorous druid and uh, eating meat is okay because that's a part of the natural order. Those are lifestyle choices that this metal taboo could carry. In fact, you could even carry it in another direction and say... I will not use, uh, I, I will not even handle metal weapons. Or any time that your character would receive coins as payment, uh, he's quickly, uh, he quickly tries to convert it to precious stones or uh, pieces of art, like little carved statues or something that have an equivalent value to carry because uh, metal is just such a, a taboo or, you know, something else. Uh, Sir Rody um, says, Bone Armor and Stone Shield. Yeah, in fact, you can even work with your DM to reflavor something. Uh, maybe maybe there's a type of tree called Ironwood. Wink. And so it's a rare tree, but it just so happens that this Druid Circle has access to it. And so you are wearing, um, you are wearing plate armor, statistically, though your DM has worked it in such a way that it is not violating your taboo. Things to think about. <laughs> Steel dust. <laughs> oh my goodness. Seven natural ones in a row on their attacks. Gosh. Yep. And and that happens. That's a big uh, roleplay opportunity. Hopefully they're able to uh, to get through that. Uh, now we have our weepones. Clubs, daggers, darts, javelins, javelings, javelings. Apparently, it's a, a coffee-based race. Maces, quarter staffs, scimitars, 
sickles, slings, ooh, and spears. You can see that this class gives you a long list of very specific weapons as a way to try and navigate the waters of avoiding metal as possible. Yes, daggers, sickles, or scimitars will have metal in it, but they're trying to make it thematic and still giving you options as a player to have different damage types or different uh, damage rolls. Oh, good roll, Delcorin. Delcorin has executed Order 66. Well, uh, it's a good thing I don't have Jedi powers then. So, uh, rest in... Uh, or, uh, well, rest in pepperonis or uh, rip in peace uh, to any of you Jedis out there watching this. <laughs> Saving throws, intelligence, and wisdom. Uh, this is going to mean that you're going to be a lot more resistant to uh, illusions and enchantments. Uh, look, you're a natural person, you understand, hey, you know what, uh, maybe a pool of water doesn't actually belong here and the signs for it aren't around. You're going to be more keen on that, which is another reason why wisdom is such a, a good score, because insight can help you see through illusion and some other things like that. Uh, and we're proficient in the tools of a herbalism kit. Herb. Skills. We get to choose two from Arcana, Animal Handling, Insight, Medicine, Nature, Perception, Religion, and Survival. Well, Insight and Religion are already occupied by our background skill, which is good in this case because that frees up... Uh, that frees up options from this skill set that we can give to our character um, without feeling like we're losing out on something. So now we can think about what kind of skills would this person have. We need to now think a little bit of the backstory. Do we want to go with Bubonic One's suggestion? Maybe this was a gnome that was adopted by goblins and, uh, and has been raised in this goblin society, was an acolyte to the goblin faith, and is now kind of setting out and is maybe even thinking he's doing good things, because good things to goblins aren't always good things to other humanoids or goblinoids. Uh, so that's what's making him evil from the from that perspective. Uh, Babacus recommends nature and perception are always good. Arcana sort of makes sense for a priestly sort, yeah? That way you can detect if magic is, is happening around. Uh, especially if, if we're going in this um, kind of eco-terrorist route, he would want to make sure that he can... Um, he can, you know, get in, get the job done, and get out. Um, perception could be a big part of that. Hmm. Survival might not be as important, because as a druid, you get a spell, uh, like your suite of spells, you can, you can take to track people, to find people, to grow food wherever you go. Um, now, you know, survival could mean if you have a party of people helping you, you are providing it for them too, but I don't know, I just see some magical overlays that can override the skill. Bobica says, if goblin, then nature and survival make sense. Mm -hmm. We didn't go with the primarily shape-shifting route, so animal handling... Um, you know, he's not trying to be an animal. He'll take on an animalistic form for, you know, uh, an advantage in combat or to try and maybe sneak into a location. You know, being a gnome, he might be able to, uh, you know, look like a larger, like a, a dog or something. And, you know, who'd suspect a, a doggo is sneaking into the town center to, you know, make uh, a little grove of trees uh, spurred out of the ground in the middle of the commercial district to disrupt things. Hmm. Well, uh, looking at... Uh, oh, I, I missed the two bubonic one. says, Dragon Skin makes excellent armor. Yeah, and, and you can scale... Huh, you can scale it to be scale armor or, you know, whatever is uh, a hide armor. Whatever is acceptable in that case. Um, Delcorn says, Great, and I actually want an orange shake. I'm sure it'd be delicious. <laughs> um... 
Oh, after saying now nah, they're safe, this orders for a double cheese and bacon burger uh, with a large fry and orange shake. So are, are we talking Five Guys burgers and fries here, Del Corin? Um, because you can't just bring up Five Guys in the middle of a stream and not expect a fat dude to be upset that he doesn't have that right now. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, Sporty Ron. Um, and, and this isn't just mine. If you want, uh, here, we'll even practice a command. There you go. Um, if you wanted to download a, uh, a little zip file of different character sheets, it's right there. You can also look before, uh, below the chat commands on the homepage of the channel, and I've posted some links that will be useful to DMs and players alike. Ebony makes excellent sharp weapons. Uh, 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 or, uh, uh, like, Ebony is in the, the wood, or do you mean obsidian, which is the volcanic glass? Or, uh, as they call it in, in uh, Game of Thrones, uh, dragon glass. Um, coming back up here, ooh, we have a... We have a very, uh, fluent druid here. Uh, druidic is its own secret language, somewhat similar to Thieves' Cant, where it, you know, your circle speaks Druidic, and it's another taboo that you should never share Druidic with anyone who isn't a Druid. Um, you know, will your circle hunt you down as a death penalty for doing so? Maybe. Maybe that's what happens in this campaign or world. Um, maybe Druidic is a more common language. Uh, you could have a whole campaign setting set up in a forested area, and Druidic is actually common, right? It's sort of like if you go over to England, and yes, you have English speakers, but you have people who still speak Gaelic, um, or, you know, like, like traditional Irish. Um, can you understand them? Mm, that depends, and I'm not just talking about, uh, <laughs> if you guys have seen the, uh, the movie Snatch, uh, with uh, how the Pikeys talk. The caravan's fair is meh. Um, okay, let's think of skills. Uh, in the meantime, a wooden shield or any simple weapon, a scimitar or any simple melee weapon, leather armor, an explorer's pack, and a druidic focus. Hmm. So maybe we go a shield... Shield and club druid? So we get a bonky druid? Um... What's nice is uh, there's a spell called Shillelagh that a druid can cast that will make uh, like a quarter staff or a club into a magic uh, magic bonking weapon. That could be cool too. Why don't we shield? And we, we could say like wooden, or it could be like a like a, a hide covered targe or something along those lines. Shield, uh, club, leather arm, a leather armoire. <laughs> Ex Explorers pack. Druidic Focus, which, if we wanted to, we could probably combine with the Holy Symbol received as an Acolyte, or we could keep them separate, and one is, um, one is, he, he keeps on him, it may not be his intrinsic faith, uh, but it's a, it's a memory of how he was brought up, and then he has his Druidic Focus to cast his Primal Powers, and, you know, we could play around with it. Uh, you know, when it comes to, like, Load, like, carrying capacity and whatnot, we're not really talking a significant weight. Uh, Druidic, so you know Druidic, the secret language of Druids. You can speak the language and use it to leave hidden messages. You and others who know this language automatically spot such a message. Others spot the message's presence with a successful DC-15 wisdom perception check, but can't decipher it without magic. Okay, spell casting. We come down here. We are casting off of uh, Wiz. Um, 
Um, we got to fill in a couple more things. We're level 10. Our proficiency bonus is going to be important to record. We're weighing in at a plus four proficiency. And then... We are going to be getting four... I'm sorry, three cantrips. So one, two, three... Four, three, 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 two. Four, three, three, two. Four spell slots per level. And uh, to determine uh, spells known, we'll, we'll get to that. We're going to have to assign our ability scores and such to aid in that. Uh, Bubonic one says, survival makes sense, as does nature or perception. Uh, Babacus, the optimizer in me, hates the idea of leaving perception unchecked on a wizard based character, but I think survival and nature are good choices thematically. Uh, I would agree. You know, we can argue um, that, we, you know, we can cast spells to help us perceive or to do things along those lines. Um, I am seeing a lot of you are saying um, that nature and... Um, uh, was it? Uh, nature and survival. So why don't we fill... Nature and survival. So we have kind of an independent uh, druid here. Maybe he was raised by goblins and is going to strike it off on his own to uh, to prove that he's worth it. Or in this case, they send him out because goblins aren't as well received as a gnome would be. But the gnome ends up uh, bungling things up because he hasn't been raised by other humanoids. Um, and so this, this can come into play here, this personality trait. I quote or misquote sacred texts and, pro and proverbs in almost every situation. Uh, sporty Ron. And then... No and then. And then... No and then. And then and then and then and then and then. <laughs> uh, is this character a Druish prince? <laughs> oh, very good Spaceballs reference. Uh, a nice Delcorin. Ah, <laughs> uh, Okay. Uh, as, uh, as Bob Ross says, you know, you, this is your bravery test. We got to jump in here. Um, I do think that we should start out with a high wisdom to give him at least a fighting chance. Uh, we have given nature and religion to this character, which are both int based skills. Uh, so I could argue something like, um, if we drop our 13 in here. That will make it a 15, cancel that out, leaving our 14 to, hmm, well, you know what, Instead, of, a club was good, I don't believe a club, though, has finesse, and that's not necessarily bad, that means we would, uh, we'd want to make him more of a strength druid, though if we go scimitar, we can go dex. And Dex is a blend of offense and defense, especially because he's most likely going to be wearing light armor that completely maximizes his dexterity, or medium armor, which gives him a base and gets to add two to that AC. The 13 in Dex is more efficient, uh, recommends Bobicus. Gives more even numbers because of the plus one from being a forest gnome. So, if, okay, so if we did that, let's let's uh, experiment. So we've used our 15, boom, that's gone. If we put our 13 in dex, which becomes a 14 and consumes that. There we go. We could drop our 14 in int, which would be bumped up to a 16. Hmm. We can have some roleplay fun 
if we wanted to go 12 in charisma, right? Because uh, this person has this habit of quoting texts to people, so he's trying to be social, or at least do like a, a villainous monologue of some sort. Um, I mean, he doesn't. We're not backing up proficiency in anything like uh, a proficiency in anything like um, intimidation. Oh, I hadn't thought about it like that much. If Lone Star isn't Druish, can Vespa marry him? <laughs> this is uh, so we we, we got to get a, like a conspiracy theory show on uh, on spaceballs, or uh, what is it? Uh, Matt Pat does game theory, and he also does something called film theory. Uh, that would be <laughs> those are questions for a channel like that, or we could just look up on IMDb because there's probably someone who's mentioned something along those lines. Uh, charisma or strength dump. Uh, yeah, Bobicus, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, um, maybe in that, uh, maybe because he so often misquotes these sacred texts and tries to make a big scene and, uh, is probably bungling it a bit, uh, we could go, I think we can go safely in an eight charisma, you know, especially, look, you're raised by goblins and then you want to go into more, uh, or like less goblin populated areas, you're not going to come across as, uh, as the best. Um, so now it comes down to, do we want, uh, maybe a little bit more utility and strength? Uh, so in this case, that would allow us to swing our club. Now, if we want to go club, are we going to always be swinging our club? Not necessarily, but, you know, we have a higher deck, so maybe, you know, maybe we go with finesse weapons in that case. In that case, you, you really can't go wrong with having, oh, hoo -hoo. This is a meaty, uh, this is a meaty forest gnome. Um, you can't go wrong with having more hit points. It's a good, just take it and you have it. So if we do that, and then we'll put 10, so he has average strength. Very independent, so higher con. Yep, that makes sense. Boom. That clears out, uh, so we have a character who symbolically was a bunch of stats. We've cleared out the stats, leaving room for who is he? Who is this character? Uh, we're level 10, so we're going to get two ability score improvements. And on our random uh, on our random uh, generator sheet, we rolled that uh, this druid will not be using feats. So if we're doing that, we definitely want to bump up our wisdom. Um, our first one would probably be 2 and 1. So that would bump wisdom up to a 17. And maybe then for our second one, we can do a one and two, and that would put wisdom to 18, and we can work on our dexterity a little bit more um, to increase our, well, either that or I don't know, maybe we just go straight wisdom and bump them to a 19 uh, to get them to 20 sooner. Yeah, Bubonic, uh, eight, eight charisma. Uh, he doesn't come across very well to people, uh, statistically anyway. Role play can always make up for, uh, R-O-L-E play can always make up for R-O-L-L play. Uh, Bobicus offers put both, uh, uh, both ability score increases in wisdom. Uh, so we have a very, a very wise, a very wise druid. All right, that is going to catch us up here. I think we're going to switch this out real quick. Actually, you know what? I wonder... I wonder if sickles are finesse. No, it's just light. Okay. Um... A light weapon. A light weapon is small and easy to handle, making ideal for use when fighting with two weapons. So it's a good offhand weapon. Um, so as per the book, anyway, it would still be a strength-based weapon if we wanted to, get to go that route. Um, we'd just be looking at maybe giving the druid a dagger of some kind, or um, or we could even go uh, we could go sling, which is um, or a dart. Dart would be interesting. Maybe even say like a dart gun, so you get that kind of like. Or that, 
<laughs> kind of a, you know, out of nowhere from the bushes, a, a dart, you know, oops, dart in your neck kind of a thing. Uh, Bobicus, yeah, you, uh, I would agree. You know, at some point in time, we can take him down a, a focus pass, uh, a path, should we revisit him and, you know, level him up or tweak him, do something like that. And, uh, and that would just give, like, a bump to wisdom and maybe focus on a particular skill set or uh, a direction for the druid. You know what? Darts are fun. <laughs> Plus, they remind me of Ace Ventura, too. <laughs> if, if, if any of you know what I'm talking about, then uh, in, enjoy the chuckle. Okay, so we have a fun villainous character going. Zero, two, one, three, almost five, minus one. Zero, two, one, seven. Eight and minus one for our saving throws. Yeah, sensible chuckle. <laughs> B Bumblebee tuna. <laughs> Psst. Bumblebee tuna. Alrighty, let's fill in our skills. Uh, so acrobatics is up here, Dex. This is where the other style character sheet, uh, I think, has an advantage in how it's set up because it arranges the skills based off of the ability score in each of the blocks. Um, you know, I do the traditional because this is how Wizards is traditionally presenting uh, their character sheet. So it's good, you know, if we're talking bread and butter, D&D, you know, D&D &D 101, getting you used to referencing the PHB and the normal character sheet is good. And from there, you can homebrew a character sheet. I made a homebrew 4th edition one. That was that was a lot of fun, actually. Um, you can find all kinds of ones submitted uh, online. Uh, just do a, a Google search or an image search. Uh, you can also go to the, the DM Guild link that is on the, the homepage of the channel. And people have created all sorts of content. Uh, so, here we have uh, our plus two from Dex. Let's go to our other Dex scores. Doing it this way also, especially as a, pl well, as a player or a DM, it is getting you familiar with which skills use what on a ease of access basis. Animal handling. So, we're taking a whiz of four. Insight's going to be a plus eight. He may not know why you're making fun of him, but he knows that you are making fun of him. Plus four. Plus four, perception. Plus eight, survival. Arcana. Three. History is three. Investigation is three. Nature is plus seven. Religion is seven. Strength is zero. And that's the only strength-based skill that is, like, officially recognized. You might want to run other things through strength for some reason. Um, you might be able to argue with your DM. I'm really straining my eyes to see as far and as clear as possible. I'm straining my eyes. Can I roll a perception strength as a, I don't know, like a raging barbarian or something? <laughs> and then you, you give him like, you give him the stink eye, right? You got this like bulging eyeball, like, you know, like think of some like Ren and Stimpy, like when they, they cut to the, the static uh, scene from the imagery, and it's usually like super detailed, quasi-grotesque, right? The veins bulging, so you just got this, you got this barb who's raging and is using a strength-based perception check to look really hard. <laughs> Deception is <laughs> charisma-based. 
Intimidation is two. What a can uh, what a quinky dink. Minus one charisma, minus one persuasion. There we go. <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, okay, so our con is a plus one. Uh, druids get d8s, so at first level that's going to be nine, and then we get nine levels of five. Plus one is six. So we have, there we go, 63 hit points. Our initiative, uh, we have kind of a twitchy druid, right? Initiative is two, not bad. Uh, that's another reason why dex is very powerful in this edition, because not only is it offensive and defensive, uh, it influences your initiative, and if you can act first, uh, in a combat, that lets you set up uh, uh, maybe a buff spell. It lets you set up uh, a position or placement. Um, it, it lets you act first. Mm, pardon me. If any of you play Pokemon, you know, speed is an important part of a battle. And initiative is uh, can be indicative of your ability to act first and make the first, uh, the first move. Oh, pardon. Random hiccup. Uh, I had some very spicy salsa before starting the stream, so uh, maybe it's getting a little revenge on me. Uh, right now, it looks like we're wearing leather armor, which is 11 plus dex. So we're in at a 13, but we have a shield, so that's going to add an extra 2. So that's going to be a 15 armor class. Uh, we are proficient with darts, so that's going to be 4 plus dex, plus 6 for a dart in the neck. And the damage type is 1d4 plus 2 piercing. And I'm sure um, there is a difference between an herbalism kit and a poisoner's kit. Could you, as the DM, or you as a player arguing with your... I mean, not arguing uh, as a D, uh, with your DM, could you replace that with a poisoner's kit instead of a, an herbalism kit? And so maybe he or she will let you do that, and suddenly you can... Um, you can poison the darts for poison damage or to make someone go to sleep, kind of like uh, the traditional drow poisons um, or paralyze them or do something along those lines. So, you know, think of options. What's What would be thematic to this character? If we're saying that your character is raised by goblins, what are goblins prone to do? RPG now has a decent selection of character sheets. Thank you, Bubonic One. Uh, anytime you guys have suggestions or links, um, share it. You know, we're in this together. I I don't have a horse, you know, a, a prideful horse in this race. If, if you guys have even, you know, like a, a better source than what I provided, put it out there. I don't know everything about everything. So, cool. You you did a good job. Thank you, Bubonic. Alright, I believe all of our base stuff here is taken care of. So we're on the home stretch for this character. Keep, uh... Keep a name in mind. Um, it could be a, a, a goblin name, whatever you think a goblin name would be, whatever you think a gnomish name, whatever you think of a fusion of the two. Maybe he only goes by a nickname. Maybe by becoming a druid, uh, he leaves his his na like his uh, birth name behind and assumes a druidic name or some sort of a natural name of some kind. We're also going to start needing some uh, characteristics here soon. Hairstyle, length, um, you know, is it curly? What color is it? Same with his skin. Um, and what are the features of his eyes? Our spell save was 8 plus proficiency, which is 4, plus our wisdom, which is 4. So this is going to be a 16 spell save. And the spell attack bonus is proficiency plus the spellcasting stat. So this is going to be a plus 8 to hit with... Uh, spells that require a two-hit roll. Spellcasting class, we're just going to be a straight-up druid. And I do need to reference real quick... There we go. The druid table shows how many spell slots you have uh, to cast at first level and higher. Uh, yeah, we, we expend a spell slot. That's that's basic. Uh, you prepare the... Um, Alright, yeah, you prepare the list of druid spells that are available to you to cast, choosing from the druid spell list. Um, so, you... 
you know every druid spell, potentially. Like you, it's like the cleric. You can just pull off of the entire list. Comma, however, comma, you can only prepare X amount of every spell. And then of X amount of every spell, you can only funnel them through Y amount of spell slots. Whether that's a straight up casting that spell as, as that level, a first level spell is a first level, or if a first level spell allows you to juice it up and cast it as a third level spell with an added benefit, that would consume a third level spell slot. Bobakus is offering, na his name is Birog. No last name. Right. Sometimes simple can be powerful. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. Uh, to prepare, uh, oh, we, uh, when you do so, choose a number of druid spells equal to your wisdom modifier. So in this case, four, plus your druid level. So we're looking at uh, 14 spells canon. And you could do ritual casting as well. Uh, we have, we do have Wild Shape up here. Okay, we'll come back to Wild Shape. Or actually, you know what? We're here. Let's do it now. Uh, so he didn't take the, the specific, like the more shaping Druid path that you can take as a Druid. Um. Though here, uh, starting at second level, you can use your action to magically assume the shape of a beast that you have seen before. And this is something to work out with your DM, too. Because I can go into a monster manual and cherry-pick a monster that I want to turn into. Though, would that make sense that here I am, I live in, um, I live in a, a desert region. And I want to turn into a polar bear. Or I want to turn into a saber-toothed tiger. If, you know, so th that can create a little bit of a sticky wicket that you and your DM need to talk about. You know, what would be a list of approved animals or you as the druid player, do you want to keep track of the animals you've seen, uh, you know, during your adventure, like a travel log kind of a thing. A uh, druidic female name and also sounds goblin-y. Yeah. Birog. Birog. Um, all right, so your druid level determines the beast that you can transform into, as shown on the beast shapes table. At second level, for example, you can transform into any beast that has a challenge rating of one-fourth or lower that doesn't have a flying or a swimming speed. Uh, so at eighth, we can turn into a max CR... Um, we can turn into a, a max CR creature. And there's no limitation, so we can turn into a giant eagle and, uh, you know, carry the, the ring bearer. Um, almost to the goal. Uh, you can stay in a beast shape for a number of hours equal to half your druid level. You then revert to your normal form unless you expend another use of this feature. You can revert to your normal form earlier by using a bonus action. So yeah, um, that might be a fun thing to do. Um, uh, we'll finish up the mechanics of the character, and then while I take a break, uh, why don't you all think of maybe a couple, uh, a couple animals that we can write down on a note here, maybe under... Uh, additional features and traits or character backstory and uh, you know like whatever three four five animals that uh, he's seen along the way that uh, this gnome can turn into I think that would be a lot of fun as well and then we'll we'll type that in at the uh, you know once uh, we come back from break druid 14 spells canone that does not include cantrips so we're going to have to spread that 14 out throughout 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th level. Come down here. If any of you have questions about the spell list that we're looking, because we're looking at just a raw list. These are the spells that druids know by name and nothing else. If you have a question on one, let me know and we can zip over to it, or I might be able to explain it off the cuff. Or even some of you in chat, because you guys have been really helping each other out. Um, you can also fill that in so I can continue uh, streaming and going from there. Druid cantrips, druid craft, guidance, mending, poison spray, produce flame, resistance, shillelagh, and thorn whip. Thorn whip is a very good uh, cantrip because it is a um, it's a kind of a magical weapon attack. You can produce this 
thorn whip and use it to uh, lash people. I think that we should do something that's uh, offensive, maybe something that's supporting, and then, you know, a, a mix of either. Um, as a heads up, uh, druid ca uh, Druidcraft, because that is rather specific here. Come on, alphabet, work for me. Here we go. Whispering to the spirits of nature, you create one of the following effects within range. You create a tiny, harmless sensory effect that predicts what the weather will be at your location for the next 24 hours. The effect might manifest as a golden orb for clear skies, a cloud for rain, following snowflakes for snow, and so on. The effect persists for one round. You instantly make a flower blossom and uh, a seed pod open or a leaf bud bloom. You create an instantaneous, harmless sensory effect, such as falling leaves, a puff of wind, the sound of a small animal, or the faint odor of a skunk. The effect must fit in a five-foot cube. Uh, as well, you instantly light or snuff out a candle, a torch, or a small campfire. I like that as a druid. Uh, it's kind of like uh, thaumaturgy or prestidigitation, just with a different set or like a different angle on the here's a list of minor things that you can do. And you might be able to imp impress your DM uh, to expand that idea into something else. Um, it's up to you. Thorn whip, you create a long vine-like whip covered, uh, or a, a whip covered in thorns that lashes out at your command towards a creature in range. Make a melee spell attack against the target. If the attack hits, it takes 1d6 piercing damage. And if the creature is large or smaller, you pull the creature up to 10 feet closer to you. Um, you might even be able to argue with your DM to allow you to grab objects, but that's the spell... The spell as written and as intended does state creatures. Mm, though, whatever, it's your world, it's your story. Um, and then, uh, despite it being a cantrip, it will just naturally become more powerful as you do. In this case, because, uh, well, we're on not quite 11th level yet. So at next level, it's going to go up to 3d6 that you can just keep whipping out over and over again. Uh, Delcorn is offering Drusub to the Druid. Uh, Goblin-like wolves, too. Uh, wolves and um, uh, warg. Um, you know, traditionally in the Monster Manuals, you see them riding wargs, which are kind of... Um, I don't know, you have dire wolves, which are more of like a natural uh, evolution or whatever, a side evolution to wolves. Wards are, wargs are kind of like a uh, aberration form. Like you, you can define it in a lot of different ways. Devalian, why are you making so many characters? Uh, yeah, Bo and as Bobicus answers, to demonstrate the process and for funsies. Um, these aren't characters that I'm necessarily going to play. Um, as, as my stream uh, demonstrating D&D, trying to teach it to people, opening up a stream with a character creation gets our creative juices flowing. It, it gets us thinking about more than just a character, a setting, a theme. Uh, it, it's, bring, it's brought us a lot of laughs so far um, because we're, we're thinking about, um, we're thinking about uh, other references to things. And so now we actually have kind of a comedic, eco-terrorist, evil druid gnome who's been raised by goblins. So yeah, it's a character. Will I ever play it? No. But at the same time, if I, you know, if I release these documents to you all, would you want to run this as a character? Or even as a DM, would you want to pull this character off and use it in a campaign? So it's, you know, it, it's for fun and it's just, it's a, a good way to keep things fresh in our minds and to constantly learn without being overburdened. <clears throat> Uh, Del Corin, yeah, uh, th your theory was creating backstories for the NPCs in the world we created. Uh, that's true, too. We found ways to weave in these characters as NPCs into this town, or we even created this whole campaign around uh, that elf and that dwarf uh, at, at uh, prior in the week. Uh, 
All right, now we need to, let's go back, let's jump druid cantrips, and I think something like a, uh, hmm. So we have a utility, we have an offensive power. Guidance is never a bad choice for a cantrip. That said, kind of like, you know, taking Wisdom or Perception, as uh, as Bobikus was saying earlier. We can always put it in. Can we challenge ourselves to make a character that doesn't use Guidance? Hmm. Shillelagh could be fun. Resistance, though... Uh, resistance isn't bad either, since that's going to give us, uh, I think that's just going to make us resistant to non-magical, uh, piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing damage. And that can be important, especially as a spellcaster, because if you take damage while you're concentrating on a spell, you have to roll a concentration, which is a con-based roll, a, a save, and, um, you can lose your spell if, uh, you get hurt a little bit too much. Element OP. You touch a willing creature. Um, oh, once before the spell ends, the target can roll a d4 and add the number of rolled on a saving throw of his choice. Okay. Um, Bobicus is offering poison spray isn't great, but it's thematic. Uh, Thorn Whip is better than Shillelagh. Yeah, you know, and, and, and here we can cross uh, Fluff and Crunch together when we're talking spells. And remember, uh, too, we are, we're creating with this character on an average day. What, what would this character be more likely to take? What is his spell suite by default? Because at, between long rests, we can go completely offensive. But if we're going to make a balanced one, you know, that's kind of showing his personality, what he expects, wants to maybe prepare for, or be ready to handle on any given day, this is going to be a great uh, extension of his personality. Uh, you know what? We have an eco-terrorist character, even if he's a comedic villain. Poison Spray, I think, could work in there. All right, so, ladies and gentlemen, 14 spells known to distribute between these four levels of spellcasting. I find it's easier to make a, uh, to start at the higher levels, because there's usually less available anyway, and to work back, because then you get to broader or more scalable, um... You get to broader or more scalable spells later when you would want many choices. So let's start out and give him, I don't know, one or two fourth level spells. Cleric, Druid, fourth level. Blight, Confusion, Conjure Minor Elementals, Conjure Woodland Beings, Control Water, Dominate Beast, Freedom of Movement, Giant Insect, Grasping Vine, Hallucinatory Terrain, Ice Storm, Locate Creature, Polymorph, Stone Shape, Stone Skin, Wall of Fire. There's a lot here. Um, I'm thinking um, we're, I th we're, we're definitely going with this Gnome Raised by Goblins. Uh, giant Insect sounds a lot of fun. And I have not... Um, I have not run a character that has taken that. So I think that could be a... Uh, that could be a fun spell to put in there. Let's uh, for right now, and you know what, you all, you watching at home, um, or if you're at work and watching on your mobile devices, you you naughty people. I don't blame you. Some of the guys who come into, uh, some of the guys who come to the store, like they work graveyard shift security or other things like that, where there's not even deliveries that are coming in, and uh, and so they just sit in a booth. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so, so they're, they're kind of just, like, there to push a button if someone comes by or to, uh, you know, answer a phone, maybe. And so uh, they'll often watch Twitch or YouTube on a, uh, on a phone or a tablet or something. So if you do that, I don't blame you, but don't get in trouble for it, speaking as a, as a boss, okay? <laughs> Wall of Fire seems like a good way to attack a town, yeah? 
Um, I I can see that as a way to attack. What if what if we went a little bit bigger though, and we went with something like conjure woodland beings or conjure minor elementals? Because why just make a wall of fire if we can actually summer, uh, summon a fire elemental to like dance rooftop to rooftop, setting things on fire, or to create an earth elemental to block up the sewers? You know, because it'll just stand there. And, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, sewage comes up or air elementals to, uh, I don't know, mess up people's hair or act as a perverted wind, uh, which is an anime reference, uh, if any of you are getting that. Though Bobacus is making the, uh, he's saying it's defensive, offensive, and distracting. It is. Delcorin, I used to use audio-only mode at work until I was moved to a different area where reception sucks. Oh, hey, and you won that Voltron you showed me. Cool. Whoop. Okay, so we have two options for fourth-level spells. Let's look at third-level. Call Lightning, Conjure Animals, Daylight, Dispel Magic, Feign Death, Meld Into Stone, Plant Growth, Protection from Energy, Sleet Storm, Speak with Plants, Water Breathing, Water Walk, and Wind Wall. I can definitely see Sleet Storm. That creates a cylinder of like ice and wind that not only is it dealing this cold damage, it is also creating difficult terrain because everything's getting icy. Um, and that's a good way also to help mitigate um, uh, flyers. Uh, so, you know, if you have dragons or like, I don't know, even sturges or something flying around and buzzing, um, because it's a cylinder that goes up from your point of origin, it's creating this whole space of this, you know, elemental force that is also providing difficult terrain which I don't know if we've covered that much yet in uh, on sort of the DM side. Difficult terrain, um, you can say it halves your movement, unless you have something that says otherwise. It's a two for one. If you can move 10 feet and you go th and all 10 feet are difficult terrain, you can only move five feet through. Call lightning could be interesting because that's kind of weather modification. You do make the clouds swirl and you bring lightning down on things. Um, conjure animals, I don't really see. He's not necessarily animalistic. He's more of a force of nature himself. Daylight, he doesn't need. He can see in the dark. Uh, dispel magic. Uh, if, we're, if we're going for an eco-terrorist sort of route... Uh, you know, that could dispel nature magic and arcane. I don't know, if he was going as the kind of anti-arcane, like a naturalist um, route that might be a little bit more uh, appropriate in a general suite of spells. Remember, he can do any of these at, uh, on any day after an eight-hour rest. Feign death, uh, meld into stone, could be interesting. Um, plant, uh, plant growth is good. In fact, I, I was even referencing that uh, as something that he could do, right? You go into town square, into the park, and all of a sudden you use plant growth and now, you know, the the playground is covered with these thorny vines, or you go down, like, Market Street, and um, and uh, it's it's cobbled or it's dirt, and but, you know, between the cobbles is just dirt or mud or something. And so you, you go to this main avenue, and suddenly you use plant growth, and the whole road just becomes this, you know, difficult terrain mess or something along those lines. Uh, Bobacus is offering, I like to spell magic for this guy. It allows him to break into protected areas. Uh, yeah, I can see that too. And you know what? There's nothing necessarily saying that we can't, uh, you know, make him... He's not going to be top-heavy, right? We're not loading him up with uh, with all these spells. But we we do have one more level above Dispel, so if he needed to juice it up, he can. And he, can st he still has three spell slots, so he could cast one of each if he really wanted to. Um, water walk and water breathing are good. Maybe, uh, I know we hadn't really defined this as what type of a, a setting he would be in. Um, if we're talking goblins, I think that brings to mind more hills and mountains or deep woods, which might have ponds and rivers, but I don't see him 
in a general spell suite. Again, he can wake up saying, I'm going to go to this coastal fishing village and completely change this list the next day. Um... Nevelian, I like melding the stone for going through walls and for breaking in. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I get it thematically what you're saying. Uh, Sporty Ron, you're still here. Hey, uh, you you know, uh, you don't always have to talk. Lurkers are always welcome too. This is just as much like you auditing a, a like a class, right? You're just sitting. You're not being graded on it, but you can still sit and learn, and you know, and go from there. All right, so we have uh, we have five spells of our fourteen, so that leaves nine left. That we can always come back to four and three, but let's fill in uh, some twos and ones for maybe some some juicy effects uh, that are that are still uh, that we can always ramp up. Second level: Animal Messenger, Bark Skin, Beast Sense, Dark Vision. <laughs> yeah, because he needs dark vision, right? Enhance ability: Find traps, Flame Blade. Flaming Sphere, uh, for when you want to go bowling and set the alley on fire. Uh, gust of Wind, Heat Metal, Hold Person, Lesser Restoration, Locate Animals or Plants, Locate Object, Moonbeam, Moonbeam's a fun one, uh, Pass Without Trace, Protection from Poison, and Spike Growth. <clears throat> There's a lot of cool stuff that uh, that he can do here. Um, if he's going to go Assault Cities, I don't know if he's really going to take Fine Traps in a general spell suite. Definitely not Dark Vision. Enhance Ability, maybe, uh, because that will give you... Um, that will grant you advantage on an ability save of your choice. So, I don't know if he thinks he's going to need to be dodgy or to go into a poisonous area and... Uh, as a character, he's internalizing it differently, but as a player, you say, oh, he's probably going to have to make a lot of poison saves or something. Uh, he could cast that, and it would give him advantage on con saving throws. Uh, entangle. <laughs> hmm. I think bark skin would work because uh, let's even say he's not planning an attack on something. You know, what if he wants to move through a lot of thorns? Yeah, he's a druid, but he doesn't want to get scratched up or anything. And so it, it's a good protective spell against uh, that kind of a thing too. Uh, Evelian heat metal is uh, heat metal is awesome, and I can see that being used in a lot of different ways. Uh, I think that's an excellent suggestion. I was thinking that as well. Town Guard in full armor rushing to arrest them with their unnatural metals. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, then it, uh, and, and conversely, chill metal too was another interesting one as well. Uh, Bubonic says delays making things hard. Um, is it, uh, like, I see that it, for whatever reason I'm dropping some frames on my end. Is this, uh, is it just because there's kind of a natural 10 second delay between what I say and when you get it? Or what are you, uh, what kind of a delay? Is it, is it something on my end more? Is it the Twitch platform? Or, um, is, are you having an internet hiccup yourself and you need me to kind of space things out a, a couple seconds longer for you? If you need an accommodation like that, let me know. It's not a big problem. I think locate object might be interesting. That would allow him to travel to different places, or if he's looking for something to destroy, he could cast that spell in a, in a general sense. Oh. No, oh, no, Bubonic, what did you trigger? Oh. <laughs> Bubonic got the, got the uh, all caps, or like majority caps, uh, <laughs> slap on the wrist. It, it, don't worry, uh, you're only stunned for a round, uh, so the timeout is six seconds. <laughs> you'll, you'll be back. Uh, but he said Heat Metal is the best Druid spell. Uh, just a 10 second delay. Okay, Pass Without Trace. Yeah, and I think Pass Without Trace is a good one too. That's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, this leaves five more spells. Why don't we fill in a couple first levels, and then we'll see if we have any danglers that we want to plop down somewhere. First level spells. 
Animal friendship, charm person, create or destroy water, cure wounds. You know, packing a cure is not a, uh, not a bad thing, even if it's only one, because you can scale it up too. Uh, cure wounds, detect magic, detect poison and disease, entangle. Uh, the, entangle was uh, was brought up earlier. Uh, fairy fire, fog cloud. Goodberry. Goodberries are, uh, th that's a staple druid spell in a lot of cases. Doesn't mean we have to use it, but many people do. Healing Word. Jump. Long Strider. Purify Food and Drink. Speak with Animals. And Thunder Wave. Off the top of my head, and hey, suggest otherwise if you want. Uh, I did see Entangle. So we'll, we'll do a viewer's choice there, right? <laughs> Um, I do think we should pack a Cure Wounds, at least one, if not dedicate uh, two preparations. Though, again, if this is like you wake up on an average day, you know, that'll that'll cover your boo-boo should you get one. Uh, Evelion likes Thunder Wave. Thunder Wave is useful because as people get close to you, uh, you say, No, get away! And you throw your hands out and, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they get pushed back. Um... Fog Cloud, uh, I do see, and Goodberry's good. Now, Bobicus, I, I do want to ask you, why would you say uh, for this character in a general spell suite, and uh, not that I wouldn't put it down, but um, uh, Charm Person, uh, why would you choose Charm Person for this character? Oh, yeah, Valian Fus Roda! <laughs> um, yeah, Goodberries are excellent utility. Right? One berry will last you all day, and I... If I recall correctly, they also give you a hit point back, so you can use them like a sensu bean, right? Uh, in in Dragon Ball, you can bring someone back. Uh, they're not back at full, but you can get them up if you need to. Good berry. Fog cloud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. We have room for one more spell. Um. All right, so Bobacus is coming back and defending that choice. He's got a good survival and nature check. Charm person to infiltrate. Uh, probably because <laughs> he might know that he's not the best at that kind of thing uh, without magical aid. Um, Avelian, we do have uh, we do have summon spells here in fourth level: giant insect and conjure minor elementals. All right, we'll put a charm person in case he actually has to interact with someone um, that's not a goblin. Cool. All right, we have a um, we have a general spell suite going here. Uh, he's at full. We haven't expended any spell slots yet. There we go. Um, we'll make a note because by the book, this racial minor illusion operates off of int. Fortunately, he is a smarty character, um, though, was his int? Yeah, int was one less. We'll make a note of that, but if you, um, if you buy your DM a pizza, he'll probably let you uh, run it off of wisdom. All right, there were a couple question marks left. Uh, Bubonic is saying it's Twitch making it longer than 10 seconds, more like 30. Wow, you're getting a 30 second delay? Yeah, hashtag bribe your DM. Um, also, Avelion, I call those uh, hashtag 10th level spells. So the last couple things here. Okay, remember, um, boys and girls, we're going to need some physical features and a name. Uh, I know some of you have already submitted it. Um, you can resubmit it here in just a little bit. We need to fill in two languages. One of those we are putting down as goblin, right? Because this was a gnome that was adopted by goblins. Uh, and we should write that uh, adopted by goblins as a note for future, uh, for future use. This character needs to know one more, uh, one more language. 
Uh, Sylvan is uh, not a standard language, but given given that he's a druid or something else that we can put in the backstory, maybe that's available. Uh, you know, we could go with an uncommon one like um, uh, Primal or Draconic, or we could even go, you know, gnomes are akin to halflings, so maybe, um, you know, halflings kind of a, it's not really a secret language per se, but it's a special twist on common. We might be able to go that route, or even, or even of all things, have it speak giant or dwarven. Um, all right, yeah. What would you like to see as this other as this other language that he can speak? Oh, and I'm going to adjust this up here too, where it says, "I misquote sacred texts and proverbs in almost every situation." Something that lives in the city. Okay. Um, Kenku, I, it might be a very specialized language, and Kenku are often adept at mimicking others. Um, I don't know if necessarily Kenku... I don't know. I don't mind the suggestion, and any of you can suggest anything, but Kenku is not really... I don't know. It doesn't seem to be jiving, right? So we have this gnome raised by goblins. Not that Kenku can't exist, maybe further up on the mountain. We go kind of like a Japanese Tengu thing, where the Tengu live up in the mountains. Um, what if, uh, let's do this. Whoops, uh, not there. Aha! Oh my, okay. Yeah, that, that's going to take... We're, we're going to start from here. Common, Dwarvish or Dwarven, Elvish, Elven, Giant, Gnomish... Goblin, Halfling, Orc. Exotic languages are Abyssal, Celestial, Draconic, Deep Speech, Infernal, Primordial, Sylvan, and Undercommon. Undercommon could be interesting, too. Um, I don't know about you all. In, in my campaign world, I treat Draconic almost as uh, Latin to us, right? It was, it was a mother tongue very old, not really spoken by anyone anymore, but there's a lot of, like, the foundations of magic or, you know, science are written using Draconic, um, so it makes it kind of an obscure but universal language to know, especially if you want to delve into history or religious texts or old magical texts before they were uh, then printed, you know, think like the Reformation, right, the Christian Reformation, everything was print printed in Latin, and then after the Reformation, uh, we started seeing um, religious material printed in native languages, so it became more accessible to the people of different areas. Avelian, yeah, I uh, treat it like ancient Greek and use the alphabet. Yeah, uh, it's it's fun doing that kind of a thing. Uh, you know, taking these things that we know in in uh, in real life and applying it in uh, the same way but different in the fantasy realm. Bobica says, I was sort of thinking he spent some time in the city before he decided they needed to be destroyed. Like he had tried to adapt to civilization before he decided that it was impossible and it must be cleansed. <laughs> uh, he's an acolyte of an evil deity, so Abyssal makes sense. Uh, yeah, and, um, uh, uh, and, you know, goblins, maybe the uh, maybe Abyssal then is the holy language for uh, for the goblins. That's a good, that's a good one. Because he's not exactly, he's not like in a woods... Where he's this, you know, neutral or good, you know, survival who wants to, you know, hug trees and pet squirrels all the time. It's not that he won't or that he can't. That's just not his his take on things. Okay. There we go. That's filled in. 
All right, now I did see uh, Bubonic, there we go, had some traits to offer up. And so you all, uh, let's give feedback to each other, Bubonic and... Uh, and here, Bubonic is saying he's seeing this person with black piercing eyes, oily black short hair, and uh, heavily warty dark skin. Um, which could, uh, if not, uh, you know, the form of the beasts that he takes, could even just show that uh, his his natural tendencies to blend in with those he's been around, those are almost like goblin-style traits. So maybe he's a gnome, but uh, he could be mistaken for a goblin at times, depending on, you know the light or, you know, the angle he's taking. Um, so, like, dark. Let's go, like, a, um... Let's go, like, um... Hmm... Oh, you know what? Uh, it was used in chat earlier. Let's go with ebony, right? So you, you have this wood, but it's like this dark, rich wood uh, color. So he has darker skin and uh, bumpy or warts. Or, I don't know, maybe he permanently has uh, um, uh, goose pimples. Or goose bumps. And then what? I, it's goose bumps and... And chicken skin is, uh, is what it's also called. Maybe with a sickly green hue. Um, ebony. Subtle green. Bumpy. Hair. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting... Uh, we're, we're going with oily black short hair. Um, maybe not really sticking out per se, but maybe it's smoothed back. Especially, like, if you're moving through nature, right, you don't want stuff to stick forward and catch. Uh, but if a branch were to brush over his head, uh, it would just kind of, like, uh, comb through his hair. And maybe that's even why his hair is oily. It might even not be naturally as such. But he he puts, uh, like, a, a pomade of animal fats or of, um, I don't know, just like a vegetable oil in his hair. Uh, not only to, like, condition it, but it helps him move through the terrain without getting caught. It's like a, a leave-in conditioner. So we'll have, like, uh, slicked back, black, oily, if I can spell correctly. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right, time to button up our character here. We need a name. Uh, I know that one was provided earlier. Uh, I, I don't have a note in front of me, but uh, do any of you in the audience want to throw out a couple names, nicknames, given names, family names? Uh, all names must go. Name Emporium. Hmm. One, it was it was like uh, I was thinking uh, Greedo, but that's the uh, that's from Star Wars. It was it was something along those lines, Glibnob or <laughs> ah, Birog. So we have a B-Rog. Do we want to leave it as such, chat? Uh, do any of you want to add something to B-Rog? Or uh, B-Rog, uh, as his name is also his title, so we have, like, B-Rog the Slick. Maybe he thinks he's slick, and also because he slicks back his hair. Um, or or if he wants to create this, like, eco-terrorist personality, we have um, B-Rog the... Terrible, or... B-Rog, the... something. <laughs> B-Rog, the B-Rog. Or we could even, uh, if we want to do it on the back end, we have, like, um... Uh, like... 
not necessarily the name is Underbrush, but he's just known as Underbrush Birog, or, you know, like, uh, um, Sniffer Birog, something like that. Someone else has suggested, uh, Drusp, Drusp Birog. Drusp Birog. Birog, the purifying flame. That would be interesting, <laughs> and that could even go into the misquotes, right? Because yes, he can have fire powers, uh, but maybe he doesn't. He doesn't always remember to take them before he goes on an assault, right? Because we're talking about oh, there's a strategy of firewall, and he can take flaming sphere and heat metal and all this other stuff, and uh, <laughs> and maybe he just forgets. <laughs> so he is Birog, the purifying flame, who, and everyone kind of braces for that, right? <laughs> And then he rolls into town and poison sprays people. And, <laughs> and he summons a big bug to just chew on... <laughs> oh, pardon, there's a hiccup again. Alright. So, we have this character done. Uh, I am going to... Uh, I'm going to go in for a short rest. Um, in the meantime, before we come back for our second part... Uh, I want you all to think of a couple different animal forms that you think he could change into. Um, some kind of like an amphibian or a fish or a mammal or a bird or something along those lines. Uh, wh what are a couple things? If you have monster manuals, you can look in there or you can just offer something up. And then we'll come in and add those in as a good transition and go from there. <laughs> 